Welcome to the Dundee and Angus College Zoo Animal Behaviour and Welfare documentary. We have been working in conjunction with Camperdown Wildlife Centre as part of our course to undertake a behavioural study on zoo animals and their behaviours. As part of our study, we had to choose a species of our own choice, mine being the Hyson's macaw. Zoos have changed over the years and are a lot different from what they used to be. Zoos' main focuses are research, conservation and education, with welfare being the highest priority. So, let's go back to the early 1960s when the welfare of animals all began. The Five Freedoms The Five Freedoms came about in 1965 in the Brambles Report, which was aimed at the husbandry of livestock animals. The report stated that animals should have the freedom to do the following without difficulty. Stand up, lie down, turn around, groom themselves and strip their limbs. They were later expanded to zoos to give animals a happier, healthier lifestyle. The five freedoms ensure we meet the mental and physical needs of animals in our care. What are the five freedoms? Freedom from hunger and thirst ensures the animals have access to fresh food and water and are fed a suitable diet. Freedom from discomfort is providing the animal with a suitable environment, shelter and resting space. Freedom from pain, injury and disease is by prevention and providing rapid diagnosis and treatment when required. Freedom from fear and distress is to avoid the animal's mental suffering. And freedom to express natural behaviours is providing the animal with a natural environment and company of animals of their own kind. Although following the five freedoms is important, there are also certain acts in place to maintain the standards of animal welfare within zoos. Zoo legislation The Zoo Licensing Act in 1981 The Act aims to ensure that animals kept in enclosures are provided with a suitable environment to provide the opportunity to express most normal behaviours. The main effect of the Act was to regulate zoos by requiring them to be licensed by local authorities. This, however, did not extend to circuses and pet shops. The Dangerous Wild Animal Act 1976 The Act ensures that individuals who keep wild animals do so in a way that minimises risk to the public. The Act states that no person may keep any dangerous wild animal unless having been granted a licence by the local authority. So, who exactly is in charge of all this welfare? I'm sure I'm not the only one who wants to know. The Welfare Governing Bodies The current policies in place are FIASA, which is the British and Irish Association for Zoos and Aquariums. They are a registered charity representing over 100 zoos and aquariums in Britain and Ireland. They maintain the physical and mental health of the animals, participate in breeding programmes and have a strict policy on euthanasia. EASA, which is the European Association for Zoos and Aquariums. They are a membership organisation of leading zoos and aquariums in Europe and the Middle East. They link over 340 member organisations in 41 countries. They operate the European Endangered Species Programme and they focus on encouragement of natural behaviours to minimise stereotypical behaviours. WAZA, which is the World Association for Zoos and Aquariums. They are the global alliance dedicated to the care and conservation of animals and their habitats around the world. DEFRA is the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. They are the UK's government department which handle regulations and policies involving the environment, rural affairs and food. They focus on the five principles which are based on the five freedoms. OK, so now we know the basics of maintaining animal welfare and who is in charge. Let's have a look at who actually takes care of the animals' well-beings at the zoo. So what exactly is a keeper's job? A keeper's main responsibility is to look after the welfare of the animals and to perform daily husbandry care routines. Other roles include feeding and grooming the animals, cleaning and maintaining enclosures, observing and interacting with the animals, training and handling, and to educate visitors. Keepers must also keep accurate up-to-date records of the animals in the park. Records that should be kept are feeding schedules, training and exercising, health checks and medications, veterinary visits and procedures, as well as the animals' behaviours and their nutritional diets. The Zoological Information Monitoring System, also known as ZIMS, is an online record system used by zoos and aquariums worldwide to keep a check on the animals' husbandry records. The database contains on 21,000 species, 6.8 million animals and 75 million medical records. 
Being a keeper is not an easy job. But you won't find work colleagues like these anywhere else. Indicators of good and poor welfare. Welfare standards are based on the five freedoms which act as a guideline to ensure that animals are getting the care they require. It's important to keep good welfare standards as it can have an impact on the animal's health. Good welfare will result in the animals being happy and healthy, but poor welfare can result in the animals being depressed and unhealthy. Indicators of good and poor welfare. Good welfare includes having clean water, good nutrition, clean enclosure, having escape and hiding places, having regular health checks, shelter available, good enclosure design, fed a natural diet, having various suitable enrichments, and provision of veterinary care. Poor welfare includes no water, bad nutrition, unkept enclosure, no escape and hiding places, no regular health checks, no shelter available, badly designed enclosures, fed and unsuitable diet, no enrichment, no provisional vet care, and stereotypical behaviour showing. A welfare checklist was created for the Hyacinth Macaws enclosure at Camperdown Wildlife Centre which was based on the five freedoms. Let's see if the macaw enclosure passes our checklist. They have available food and water, they have space to fly, they have a shelter, they are fed a natural diet, they have several perches and sitting areas, they have enrichment and they have each other. I think it's safe to say the macaws are in good care here. Health checks. It's very important that all animals are checked by their keepers to prevent any illnesses that may affect them. The Hyacinth macaws are given the following daily health check to ensure they remain in good health. The general behaviours, the feather conditions, eating and drinking habits and facial scoring. Poo samples are collected every six months to prevent parasites and psittacosis. They are checked by a vet if they show any signs of illness and there are isolation rooms available at the back of the zoo. Not only are health checks and daily observations important to keep the animals healthy, they can also prevent any unusual behaviours the animals may be exhibiting, which are called uncharacteristic behaviours, which we will cover next in one captive herbivore and one captive carnivore. Uncharacteristic behaviours in wild captive animals What are uncharacteristic behaviours? Uncharacteristic behaviours are when captive animals perform repetitive behaviours that are not naturally performed in the wild. In wolves, there are behaviours such as pack aggression and agitation, pacing, circling, root tracing, hyperactivity and lethargic and depression. In hyacinth macaws, behaviours such as feather plucking, bouncing, head bobbing, chronic self-mutilation of feathers and skin, weaving and swaying, over-grooming, lethargic and depression, and screaming. Such behaviours can become habitual to the animals if allowed to continue. Causes of uncharacteristic behaviours in wolves is stress, hand wearying, pre-feeding anticipation, insufficient enclosure space, the pack may be too large and no enrichment available. In hyacinth macaws it's stress, constant disturbing space in the nest area, no enrichment, incorrect environment, pre-feeding anticipation and hand rearing. Implications of hand rearing. Hand rearing is when humans raise animals from infants until they are independent enough to care for themselves. Hand rearing of wild animals is a challenging task and should be avoided if possible. They should not be taken for hand rearing unless definitely orphaned or abandoned, injured or visibly unwell or in immediate danger. Results of hand rearing may include uncharacteristic behaviours, behavioural problems, may become dependent on humans, they won't have their natural instincts, they'll find it difficult to provide for themselves and have difficulty raising their own young. So what methods are in place to prevent these animals from developing these uncharacteristic behaviours while in captivity? Preventions Identifying the source of the distress and addressing it as quickly as possible. Ensure they get social interaction with their own kind. Make their environment as natural as possible. Change feeding times to prevent pre-feeding anticipations and avoid hand rearing if it's not necessary.
Okay, so remember when I mentioned earlier that I chose to study the hyacinth macaws? Well, let's go meet the birds themselves from Camperdown Wildlife Centre to see if we can learn just a bit more about them. This is Skye and this is Navy. These guys are a large member of the parrot family and are known to live to reach 30 to 50 years. In the wild, these guys would live in Brazil, Bolivia and Paraguay in South America. These tropical rainforest birds prefer to live in palm swamps or semi-open woodland areas as they usually avoid dense humid rainforests. The macaw's beak is the most powerful of all birds and is used for cracking hard nuts which is a main part of their diet. The Hyacinth Macaw's Nutritional Requirements The wild diet consists of palm nuts, specifically Chile and Ataline palm, often those that have passed through the digestive tract of cows causing the outer cover to soften, make up most of the macaw's diet. Macaws eat large amounts of nuts to compensate for the lack of protein and fat they get from their diet. They will also eat clay from a long river bank to neutralise toxins from some of the nuts they eat. The rest of their diet is made up of fruits, nectar and various kinds of seeds, which they will travel over a vast area for the ripest of foods. diet is made up to mimic the Hyacinth's wild natural diet as much as possible. Because some of the foods they eat are not available to us, it's important we substitute their nutritional requirements with what we have available. A captive diet consists of nuts, various fruit and vegetables, and complete pellet food. They get 200 grams of nuts, 6 of each, including walnuts, hazelnuts, almonds, pilly nuts, brazil nuts, macadamia nuts, and palm nuts. They get 500 grams of mixed fruit and veg including cucumber, cooked sweet potato, sweet corn, apples, pears, bananas, mango, pomegranate, papaya, sharon fruit, grapes, coconut, plums, figs, courgette, dates and carrots. They also get 200 grams of complete pellet food to bulk up their diet which is mixed with their fruit and veg to mix it with the fruit juices so the birds are more likely to eat it. They are given complete pellet food instead of a seed mix as they tend to be picky and only choose the seeds they prefer, therefore missing essential nutrients. Food Presentation When it comes to feeding parrots, also known as citizens, there are several ways in which we can present them their foods. It's important we change the food presentations regularly as parrots are very intelligent birds and we have to keep them stimulated. Different types of food presentations are scatter feeding, bowls and food puzzles. There are several pros and cons for each method and will vary depending on species and keeper's preference. The pros and cons of scatter feeding. It encourages natural foraging behaviours as they would usually get their nuts from trees and on the ground in the wild. It provides stimulation and a bit of fun for them to find the food. The cons however are, it can make the enclosure look messy, the food can rot and can cause rodent infestation. In bowls, the pros are, they keep the place tidy, they prevent rodent infestation, and they can keep track of how much and what they're eating. The cons are, the not enough mental stimulation and could cause boredom, it could lead to obesity, and prevent them from having natural feeding behaviours such as foraging. Food puzzles. There are many different types of food puzzles for birds which act as a challenge and provide stimulation for them to work for their food. However, they're not given all the time and are more of a treat for the birds. The pros of these are It provides stimulation for the birds It prevents boredom 
and it could support stadium to prevent rodent infestation. The cons, however, are if the puzzles prove into challenging, then they may not get the food, and the food may rot if it's left for too long. Presentation of the birds is just as important, and this can be done in various ways to make it more interesting for the birds. Foods can be different shapes, cubed, mashed, sliced, grated, chunked, or left the whole, different ways, cooked, raw, or even frozen, in different containers and places, on plates, in bowls, paper cups, tied to the canopy of the trees, or even on the ground. Birds are also attracted to bright colours, so giving them a range of bright, vibrant fruit and veg will be very appealing and stimulating to for the birds. Also by presenting their foods in different places such as on the ground or in the trees is also very good for the birds as they're not only receiving their natural diet, but can also perform natural feeding behaviours as well. Studying the Hyacinth Macaw's Behaviours so each week we went to Camperdown, we created an Instagram in order to study the birds' behaviours. We recorded their behaviours over a 30 minute period in 5 minute sections and numbered off a behaviour each time it was performed by one of the birds. The behaviours that were monitored were eating, drinking, playing, vocalisation, flying, foraging, chewing, climbing, foot biting, interacting with each other and grooming. To help with monitoring the birds, we wanted to set up a hunter camera to capture the birds' behaviours when they weren't there. Unfortunately, this was easier said than done as it was said the macaws are extremely destructive. Plan A. Build a box. We decided since we couldn't put the camera straight into the enclosure as the birds would wreck it, then we would build something to protect the camera while it was in with the birds. And what better to use than an old bird box with a few modifications. Time to set up. The box was attached to a tree in their enclosure with a good viewpoint to watch what they got up to. Well, so far so good. But wait, what's in spotty? Reinforcements required. Okay, so they chewed through that too easy. We had to prevent the birds from chewing straight through the wood. So with a few more mods in the workstation and an added layer of armour, a newly improved bird box. Round two. Well, as well as monitoring and recording the birds' behaviour, part of our course was also to design and build our own enrichment, for us to compare how the birds' behaviours would change when they have enrichment and when they don't, and also to give them something new to play with. Before we began, however, we had to come up with a hypothesis on how we thought the birds' behaviours would change after the enrichment was put in. Our hypothesis stated that the birds will become more active when the enrichment goes in and will start chewing and interacting with it. Behaviours such as climbing, chewing and playing will improve. It was now time to begin the enrichment process.
record any of the results. We took weekly ethograms so we could study the behaviours of the birds over a period of time. These would give us ideas of any factors that might affect the birds' behaviours on particular days such as people in the park, the weather, or behaviours of other animals. From this data, we were able to calculate the average occurrences each bird spent doing what to create charts and graphs to display our data. Behaviours before and after enrichment Data was taken from two ethograms before and two from after the enrichment was put in and averages were calculated on how each of the birds' behaviours changed from before and after. In conclusion, the data from our results proved our hypothesis to be both correct and wrong. When the enrichment first went in, the birds didn't react how we thought they would. They were very apprehensive and vocal and didn't interact with the enrichment at all. However, when we watched over our hunter camera footage, we found the birds were proving our hypothesis correct by performing the behaviours we thought they might. The final data showed the behaviours chewing, climbing and playing did increase after the enrichment was put in. Maybe showed an average increase of climbing of zero occurrences before and rose to two occurrences after. Sky showed an average increase in playing from 0.5 occurrences before and rose to 2.5 occurrences after. We have now come to the end of our course and it is time to say goodbye to these magnificent birds that we have gotten to know over the last few months. Thank you for watching and I hope you have been inspired to study animals' behaviours and go on your own amazing journey. You won't be disappointed. I know I'm not.